And Megan has also provided cookies for anyone who is uh, interested. <laughs> I will be very shortly interested. Should we get started now? Yes, I have cool. That's part of the course. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming to today's origin seminar. Today it's my really great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lori Barge. Uh, Lori is the director of the Origins and Habitability Laboratory at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in, uh, in Pasadena. The objective of her laboratory is to bring chemical insight to bear on the question of the origin of life on other worlds and the, and the quest to find them, particularly on the icy worlds within our own solar system. Uh, Lori did her um, bachelor's in astronomy and astrophysics from Villanova and her PhD in geological sciences from USC. Uh, after graduate school, she joined Caltech and JPL, first as a postdoctoral fellow and now as a research scientist. She has achie achieved a number of prestigious awards, including the JPL Liu Allen Award, the NASA Early Career Public Achievement Medal, and the PCASE Award, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Lori is a world expert in diverse aspects of experimental uh, chemistry and their coupling to the early Earth and to the uh, environment on the on uh, the icy moons of the solar system. I particularly appreciate her work on uh, on reduced phase irons, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that she does and we're really excited that she's chosen to, to share her time with us today and give this colloquium. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lori. Thank you very much. All right, thanks very much for the invitation. So today I'm gonna to talk about some of the work that my team is doing about prebiotic chemistry and hydrothermal systems, both for the early earth, but also this can apply to the ocean worlds. And so first, before we get started, I wanna thank the lab group. Let's see if I change slides here. This is the Origins and Habitability Lab. And actually there's two of us who direct the lab. It's myself and my colleague, Scott Pearl here. And so we, we are a lab group of uh, research scientists, uh, students and postdocs who study various aspects of astrobiology. And then listed here are the students and postdocs that I supervise and who have contributed to the work that I'll show. And our work was funded by uh, NASA, NSF, and in JPL Internal. And then I collaborate with various excellent colleagues at, uh, both in the US and around the world. So what uh, my work really focuses on is astrobiology, but beyond just life detection, we're interested in a lot of the different questions that the astrobiology field wants to answer. And so we study how life originates on planets, not just how did it originate on Earth, but how could it originate in general. We look at what is the difference between life and non-life, and what would life look like on another world, because it might not look like life on Earth. We also are interested in how life affects its geological environment, and how, how geological environments can look in the absence of life as well, and how this would be different on other worlds. So all of this comes together into trying to find ways to detect life. and so. That's why I'll talk a bit later in this talk about how important it is to understand prebiotic chemistry and life's origin when we are looking for life elsewhere. So for this talk, here is an outline of what I will speak to. Uh, first, I'll talk about hydrothermal vents in general and why we think they're interesting for prebiotic chemistry. And then I'll go through some of our recent studies on the how we simulate hydrothermal chimneys and minerals, the how we study the effects of geochemistry on organic synthesis. And then in particular, we have a study about a nitrogen species and how they affect organic synthesis, and then the importance of origin of life research for life detection. And so what I'll do is after each section, I'll pause and ask if there's any questions. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask those at the end of each section. So for the origin of life, the reason this is a fundamental question for astrobiology, but the reason we really need to know this for, the, for, for planetary science is because this may be similar to other environments that we see in other worlds. On Earth, there are many different theories and reactions that are proposed to be relevant to the origin of life. There's lots of settings that have been proposed in which these reactions could occur. And they range from things like on land hydrothermal springs or hot springs to volcanism to uh, hydrothermal systems in the deep sea. And so there is no consensus yet on which environment on the early Earth or environments facilitated the origin of life. But one reason that I study hydrothermal systems as an option is because in the, in the solar system, we have many ocean worlds that are thought of as potentially habitable planets. And so these are moons like Jupiter's moon Europa, Saturn's moon Enceladus, um, perhaps you know places like Ceres in the past, Mars in the past. And so understanding whether or to what extent uh, 
prebiotic chemistry could occur in a hydrothermal system is important not just for Earth, but for understanding how likely it might be to have origin of life on any of these ocean worlds. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the vents themselves, what they're like, and the types of properties that might be relevant. So this is a, a schematic of what a hydrothermal vent generally looks like. So basically a hydrothermal vent is you have an ocean and then you have a rocky crust and the ocean water interacts chemically with that crust. It goes kind of permeates through cracks in the rock, undergoes chemical reactions and the chemical reactions can heat the fluid. It can also become heated by magma influence or volcanic activity. And then as that fluid gets altered chemically, the rock also gets altered. So the rock starts to oxidize and the fluid will reduce. And then that fluid will circulate up back through cracks in the seafloor and come back out into the ocean. And when it does that, because it is now so chemically different from the seawater, you typically get mineral precipitates forming at these interfaces. So this looks like a chimney as shown here, like a vertically oriented mineral structure that just kind of precipitates out as that fluid vents into the ocean. There's also a hydrothermal plume. So this is the black smoke of the black smoker as it comes out. It's a bunch of mineral particles, and those can then settle down and form sediments. And then there's also the hydrothermal mound, which is directly below and around the chimney. So this is rocks and minerals and chimney fragments that are kind of fallen off of the vent. And then, of course, you have the rocks down below where that fluid is coming from. So there's a lot of different locations within what we call a hydrothermal system where you have reactive minerals, such as these iron or metal uh, sulfides or hydroxides. And there's a lot of places where you could get organic chemistry occurring, even in an underwater environment. And so one recent study that we did is looking at this here shown as a deep sea vent, and there are lots of deep sea vents. These are several kilometers deep in Earth's ocean, but there are also vents that are shallow. And a shallow vent is one that is 200 meters or less below the water. Some of these are accessible by scuba divers, as shown here, but they never, they're always submerged. Other ones, they get alternatingly submerged and exposed depending on the tides. And so there's two interesting sites on Earth that represent potential analogs to an early Earth vent site that is shallow. One of these is the Streetan hydrothermal field in Iceland, which is shown here. And so this is interesting because the vent fluid that's coming out of the chimney is actually fresh water, not salt water, because that fluid is coming from rainwater that lands on the land and then percolates down and back up in the ocean floor. And so it can be exposed to light, as you can see from these photos, but it would not be exposed to the atmosphere because it's too deep. There's another site that's interesting. It's called the Prony Hydrothermal Field in New Caledonia. And this field is very shallow. And so actually, as the tides go in and out, the hydrothermal chimneys get exposed to the air and then they get covered up again with the water. And so they can be submerged in seawater, but they can also be submerged in fresh water, for example, with river outflow. And so they, these chimneys can undergo what we call wet dry cycling, where they dry out, the minerals can dry out and they can get wet again. And then the chimney would also be exposed to the atmosphere and to solar radiation. So these, these produce some interesting ideas for early Earth. And this is a figure showing some possibilities, perhaps, for a shallow vent on the early Earth. And so you might have a scenario where at high tide, the vent is submerged in seawater. It can be exposed to some radiation and maybe some atmospheric influence. For example, photochemically produced species could then interact with this vent. But then at low tide, the, the ocean goes out. And depending on the depth of the vent, some of it may be exposed to the atmosphere and directly to radiation. And then the tide can go back in, but also fresh water may submerge the vent if river if there's river runoff. And so you could get salt water, fresh water, gradients of ions, gradients of pH, and wet dry cycling all in the same environment. So these, as well as the deep sea vents, which I'm, I'm sure you're more familiar with, these all present very interesting environments for reactivity of organics and also other species. And so this is why we try to simulate these environments in the lab. They, they exist in the field, and we do study them in the field as well. But A, that's it's really difficult. It's very challenging and expensive because, especially for the deep vents, it's very hard to get these samples. And B, the vents on Earth today do not have the same conditions as early Earth. And so in order to study what a vent like this would be, we have to do it in the lab. So now I'm going to go into the uh, our lab simulations of vents. But before I go on, I would like to pause and see if there's any questions. If you have questions in the chat, okay. you can also type them there and I'll read them out. OK, looks like we don't have any yet. So I'll move on. So what we do is we want to look at those various 
parts of the vent that I showed that could be reactive. So there's the sediments, the chimney, the hydrothermal mound, and so forth. And so hydrothermal chimneys are all very different from one another. There's a bunch of different types. They have different compositions. Some of them are really huge, like the Lost City hydrothermal field chimney is, is tens of meters tall. And other chimneys can be you know, centimeters or meters tall. They can grow extremely quickly. Like you can grow a whole chimney in a year. You can also grow the same chimney for tens of thousands of years. So it really just depends on the, the rate of that fluid flow, how much mineral precipitation is going on and, you know, the various gradients that exist. The main point of what the chimney offers is the gradient between the fluids. So the seawater and the hydrothermal fluid. And we can simulate this pretty directly in the lab as shown here. So what we do is we make, we have a vial and we cut off the top of it here. And so the vial contains an early earth simulated ocean. In this case, it's just a solution containing ferrous iron. And so there's iron dissolved in here. And then we, we purge the top with an atmosphere of nitrogen. So that way it stays anoxic. And then we slowly inject a hydrothermal fluid from the bottom. And in this case, the hydrothermal fluid is, has sulfide in it. And so then the precipitate that grows is an iron sulfide chimney. And so it's a similar in mechanism to what you're seeing at, say, black smoker vents with different temperatures, obviously. And this allows us to test, you know, what structure might form here, how porous it might be, and what sorts of minerals we might make. So what this actually looks like, here's another video of one of our experiments done by my student, Erica Flores. And this is a different chemistry. So here we have an ocean that contains ferrous and ferric iron. That's why it looks yellow. And then the injection is not sulfide, but here it is hydroxide. And so as it's injected, the chimney grows slowly, and then it kind of settles into a, a type of a shape. And it's got, as you can see, there's different colors within the same chimney. You can kind of see how there's brown parts and darker brown parts. So this means you're getting different types of minerals within the same chimney and little patchwork kind of structure, which means that if you have different minerals that react different ways, you can have different reactions going on in various parts of the same mineral structure. And so the chimneys themselves, they are, they are hollow and they're full of pores. And this is one interesting fact about them that makes them interesting for organic chemistry. So here is a study we did on the, on the internal structure of these chimneys. So this is a, another chimney grown by a different student. And again, you can see the, the different colors that, that exist within the chimney. And so uh, the student removed the ocean here and the chimney stayed stable and then refilled this vessel with resin. So it hardens around the chimney like a brick. And then we did a CT scan, a 3D CT scan of the whole chimney structure. So here in the middle shows the, the structure rotating around in 3D space. And then on the right, we have an X axis scan. So going into the screen and you can see how there's all these different pores that exist within the chimney, but it's not like a cylinder or conduit. The fluid doesn't just go straight up a tube. It actually is making these different kind of pores that are, in, that are sometimes closed off but the fluid percolates through the walls within the chimney and can go from one pore to the next. And there's also cracks in the chimney that allow the fluid to escape sometimes. So the chimneys are always gonna look a little different. Each chimney is, is unique because it's, it's a function of all this convective flow and where the precipitates occur. And so while we know that these are reactive minerals, sometimes for experimental purposes, it is easier to simulate them as a sediment. And then knowing that the same reaction that occurs could also be occurring inside this chimney, especially if it's dependent on gradients. So in other experiments, we simulate the different parts of the vent, namely those sediments that can happen as the plumes settle out and then also around the hydrothermal mound. So here it's the same chemistry as the previous slide but we have our iron two and iron three, and then we mix that with hydroxide, but instead of a slow injection, we just mix them. And so this gives you a precipitate of minerals. And so these minerals represent an analog of a prebiotic earth hydrothermal sediment that could exist on the sea floor near an alkaline vent. And these are iron hydroxide minerals. They come in lots of different forms and oxidation states. So you can have ferric minerals like ferric oxyhydroxides. You can have ferrous ferric minerals like green rust or magnetite. And so all of these react slightly differently with organics and have a lot of different properties. And so one of the things that we focus on is studying the effect of, of permutating geochemical conditions on specific organic reactions. And in particular, we do study the iron redox state of these minerals, which is the study that I will show you next. And so before I move on, does anyone have any questions about the previous section? 
I wanted I wanted to read out a question from your first part of your talk. Okay. Uh, this is from Rachel Amaro. Um, Rachel is curious as where to the where the two hundred meter demarcation comes from for shallow vents. Is this a special depth chemically, optically, from pressure, or something like that? You know, I I am not actually sure. I do not know. So I will look into that and get back to you. I wonder if it is optical, but I'm not actually sure. Any other questions? All right, if not, we'll move on. So what we do now is we're looking at an iron hydroxide mineral, changing the effects of that mineral on an organic reaction that is already that we already understand fairly well. And so what we do in these experiments is we create a vial containing the iron minerals, and then we add in uh, two organic precursors, which are glyoxalate and pyruvate as shown here. These are used because they are prebiotically available, so they are formed abiotically, but they're also very interesting because they are uh, they're crucial to metabolism today, and there's a lot of studies on them in the origin of life field about that they might have been crucial to the origin of metabolism as well. And so that's why we chose to use these two. Obviously, there's lots of organics you could choose, but we wanted to have have this not be the variable, and we wanted to test a lot of geochemical variables instead on just two select organics. And then we add a nitrogen source. In this case, we add ammonium chloride. And so this represents a reduced nitrogen source that could react with these organics. And then the questions that we were trying to answer in this study is, first of all, just what organic products are produced from this reaction? And then how do geochemical conditions affect the distribution that we get of organic products? And the conditions we tested are the pH, the redox state of iron, and the concentration of ammonia. And then we wanted to know what is the fate of these organics? So do they stay in the mineral or can they be brought back into the aqueous phase? So here's what I mean when I say that the iron minerals we produce can be various redox states. So we start off by adding iron salts and just the ratio of ferrous to ferric salt that we start with determines the redox state of the mineral that we make as long as it's kept anoxic. So it starts off at 100% ferrous and that will give you kind of a green rust and then you go to a medium oxidation state like magnetite and then you can make a ferric hydroxide that appears red. So here's the methods for these experiments. Again, we take the vial, we add the iron salts at uh, whatever ratio we're testing we add sodium hydroxide to precipitate the mineral, and then we titrate to pH either 10 or 7, depending. And then we add uh, ammonium chloride at various concentrations, and then we add our organic at 2.5 millimolar, and we add either one or the other, but the reaction is the same as if they are mixed. So we react this for 70 degrees Celsius, um, maybe 50 or 100 percent Fe2, depending, though we do we have a range of iron redox states. Uh, this says pH 10, but we've also done pH 7. So they react in an anaerobic chamber, and then at the sampling time, we take a sample, we centrifuge it to separate the solid and liquid, and then the solids get uh, freeze-dried for x-ray diffraction. They can be dissolved in acid to become a liquid again, and we can analyze the iron 2 to iron 3 ratio in the solid, and then the liquid products get analyzed with organic analysis, in this case, proton NMR, so that's nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and we just get peaks for each organic that's there, and then we can quantify their abundance. So this is the reaction that we are interested in. It is the two, product, the two precursors, glyoxalate and pyruvate, reacting with ammonia and these reactive iron hydroxide minerals. And then sometimes they will produce amino acids. So basically what's going on is pyruvate or glyoxalate gets reduced and it gets aminated, which means you add on that ammonia and they, they become amino acids. So this is called reductive amination. And glyoxalate and pyruvate can also get reduced and not aminated, and those will produce reduced products called alpha hydroxy acids. So we're looking for all these products, and then we're looking at their relative abundance as a function of other conditions. So first, I'll show the results of when we vary the redox state of iron in the mineral with pyruvate only. So we know that pyruvate will reduce to form lactate or reductively aminate to form alanine in these systems. And we tested this from a completely oxidized iron mineral, so percent Fe2 would be zero, all the way up to percent Fe2 100, which would be completely reduced. And this is pH 10 and at pH 7. And so the main thing to note here is that there is only a very specific state where we favor the formation of the amino acid alanine. So it's the same reaction, same reactants, but when you change the, this geochemical parameter, you really can favor or disfavor the accumulation of the amino acid product. 
In this case, we see alanine only forms at pH 10 at about 50 to 75 percent Fe2. And so that's interesting. It means the rest of the products here are going to dominate unless you are at this specific condition. And is it the same for the other precursor? Not exactly, and that's also interesting. It means that different organics will react differently even to these permutations. So glyoxalate, again, reduces to glycolate or it can reductively aminate to glycine. And here, it's different than the pyruvate. We see that glycine forms under almost all the conditions studied. So it, depending on where you are in the gradient of a sediment or a chimney, you might expect to get different abundances of all these organic products in an abiotic setting. There's also the effect of pH, which you can kind of see here between the pH 10 and pH 7. But we did a more detailed experiment just focusing on one condition here. So this is for pyruvate only. And then this is at a redox state of 66% Fe2. And then we did a range of different pHs at that condition. And so you can see that alanine really doesn't form until pH 9. And then by pH 10, it's kind of maxed out on alanine because you've consumed all the, all the reactant. And so this, we believe, is an effect of the pKa of ammonia. And this is where ammonia, that, that's the pH where you would transition between the NH4 plus to the NH3 gas. And NH3 is going to be better at reacting in this reaction. And so we think around 9.2, which is that pKa, that you, this is why we start to see more alanine forming. So it is likely that pH, if you were to vary it like this for all these conditions, you might see different results. So this is another variable that's very important. And then we tested the effect of ammonia concentration on, for an example of glyoxalate. So here we, we stay at pH 10 and we did two redox states of iron, either 33% Fe2 or 50% Fe2. And we increase ammonia from zero to 400 millimolar. And so you can see as ammonia increases at a given condition, the amount of glycine also increases. It kind of makes sense because you get more amino acid as you have more ammonia to react. But even when you have the maximum amount of ammonia, which far, far in excess of how much glyoxalate there even is, you still don't react all of it to make glycine. So there's always going to be some side products favored here, namely this glycolate. And then as the iron gets more reduced, we do tend to get more of that reduced product. And then in, you know, in certain cases, it's going to dominate the amino acid formation. And then the other interesting thing about ammonia, and this is now for pyruvate and glyoxalate, we did a low ammonia experiment just to see that you do still have conditions where amino acids are forming even at low ammonia. And so even at five millimolar ammonia, now this is for pH 10 and 50% Fe2, even at five millimolar ammonia, we do see some amino acid formation for both glycine and for alanine. This is actually not zero. This is like 0 0.09 millimolar. So we, we know that you, no matter how much ammonia there is, you will still get some amino acid formation, but you're never going to make all amino acids. And even at low ammonia formation, you do still get some. And that's going to be important later in the, in the future study. So if you combine all this together, we can make this diagram of how these two reactants give us various products. But the products are favored or disfavored, either at the pH or the redox state of the, of the experiment. And then by kind of combining these together, we made this plot here, which gives you the relative abundances of different organic products as a function of the redox state of the iron and of the pH 7 to pH 10. And so the point being that there's not one abundance graph here. So this is this abiotic prebiotic reaction that's occurring in a geological system. There's not just one outcome for how those products might be distributed. And so it's just important to note that organic systems do generate a variety of distribution patterns of, of organics. Abiotic patterns or reactions do not give random distributions or even necessarily predictable distributions because it's so highly dependent on the geochemical parameters. It's also interesting from an origin of life perspective because each of these products <clears throat> is a monomer that can then be polymerized to make longer molecules and for things like, you know, protopeptides or things like that. And so if you have a monomer distribution that is varied depending on the geochemical conditions, would that then affect the larger molecules that form from the system? I mean, could you get functionalities that are dependent on the geochemistry in this regard? So that's something to consider. And then when we look at samples, either early Earth or maybe from other worlds, could we use abundances like this if we understood the conditions at, at which they occur? Could we use abundances of organics to backtrack to what conditions they formed at? 
The other thing that we looked at is what actually happens to these organics. So remember, this is all from samples of the liquid. And we did also observe that a lot of the organics in this experiment, they stay absorbed in the mineral. So we did a combustion analysis of this mineral phase, and we detected about 0.36 weight percent carbon in the solid. And if you back that out to what we put in initially, this is for a pyruvate experiment, we found that about half, the, half of the organics that we added in the first place are now stuck in the mineral. And then you can also just add up all of the detected organics in the liquid, set, subtract from what you put in, and then the difference is what must be in the mineral. And so if you do this as a function, again, of the iron redox state and at pH 7 and 10, the point is that it's still not constant. And so depending on the geochemical condition, there will be a different amount of the total organic that's going to be trapped in that mineral phase. So you can't even take the organic abundance of a solid or a liquid and say, therefore, this other percent must be in the mineral, unless you do experiments like this to really find out how that depends on important factors. And so uh, this is important to understand, you know, adsorption properties of these products and what else might be in there. We've tried some extractions. Nothing has really worked so far. So we're not sure if there's other reactions going on in the mineral phase. But these organics are known for strongly absorbing into minerals, and iron minerals are really great at absorbing things. So this is something else to be to be focused on in a future study. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to the effects of photochemical nitrogen species on similar reactions. But before I go on, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we got a couple. Um, one okay. from Richard Gordon. He's uh, Richard is inquiring about uh, do you use sterile conditions? So I guess uh, how do you exclude biotic effects from these systems? Yes, we sterilize everything. I mean. Pretty much everything we're doing has to be sterile, otherwise it can't be prebiotic. So, you know, we keep our reagents uncontaminated. Everything is in a glove box. There's no biology experiments around. You wash everything very carefully. And then we do lots and lots of controls to make sure that everything is reproducible and that we're not seeing any other weird organics. If there was uh, cells present in a sample like this, it would show up. And so we do a lot of controls to make sure that there isn't and that it's also reproducible. A question for me, uh, I, I'll take that privilege. You've studied the system using ammonia, uh, but for, for example, for some of these shallow systems, you might have interaction with some atmospheric photochemical things like nitrate or nitrite. Have you considered these experiments with nitrate or nitrite? That is the next section. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, sorry, before we go move forward, there's one other question from Maitreya Bose. What are the primary mineral, mineral phases? Have you looked at them under an optical microscope? Uh, not optical microscope, but we've done XRD, and so we've detected magnetite in, the, in these experiments. The thing is, though, that these minerals are highly unstable to oxidation, and so the, the detection of the mineral after it's been dried out and after it's been taken to an instrument is not necessarily the mineral that was in the experiment to begin with, and so it's, it's a little bit hard to know for sure. So it's, it's magnetite, but it's probably, honestly, a conversion product of green rust, depending on your iron redox state. All right. So then moving on to the next section. So, you know, we had the same exact question, a <laughs> secret. And so we thought, well, you know, what if you're in a shallow vent system? And this is a examples of the types of things that might occur in those shallow vents. You wouldn't just have ammonia. You would also have photochemistry. And then even if the actual photochemistry is not happening on the vent itself, the products of photochemistry, if they're dissolved in water, can then interact with the system. So there's the idea that uh, atmospheric nitrogen can be photochemically converted into nitrate or nitrite, which could be dissolved in water. And then if those were, were there in, this, in the ocean that contained dissolved Fe2 and reacting with the same types of minerals like these iron hydroxides, what would happen? And it's interesting because nitrate and nitrite and also ammonia, there, there's a lot of abiotic nitrogen chemistry that's possible in the absence of life or organics, and some of it's shown here. So it is, it is known in environmental science that iron hydroxide minerals can readily reduce nitrate or nitrite to make products including ammonia, N2O, N2, and so forth. And so we thought, well, what if we had the same reaction here, except it, the ammonia, we don't add it. And so in order to get this ammonia, could it be produced from reduction of nitrate or nitrite on iron minerals, and thus giving you the ammonia to make the amino acid? Or if this does not occur, would you, would you still need an in situ source of ammonia in addition to the nitrate or nitrite that might be present? So that was our question we wanted to answer. And this is a recent paper that we just published about this. 
So the method is similar, but a little bit different. So again, we're making that vial of minerals with iron hydroxide. In this case, we're only doing pH 10 because we want to simulate what is happening at the alkaline vent condition. And then we have our same organics present. And then for the nitrogen source now, and sometimes we add ammonia as a control because we want to make sure we're still getting our expected product. But then we, in other experiments, we add nitrate or nitrite, and these are added as sodium nitrate or nitrate salts. And then the same conditions, we, we reacted at 70 degrees Celsius anaerobically, shake, sample, and then at, analyze the liquid with NMR and the solids with XRD and colorimetry. And the colorimetry here, it gets important because we will start seeing actual iron oxidation as a function of these NOx species. So the first thing that we really noticed was that in the presence of nitrite, we, we saw dramatic iron oxidation in these experiments. So here is a sample of the, of the minerals at four days after the experiment. This is about the same timeline as the previous ones where we see the completion of the organic reaction. So this one here is glyoxylate. This one here is pyruvate. This one is nitrate, and that one is nitrite. And they both started out at 50% Fe2. And then these are the same samples dried uh, to make a, a dried solid. And so obviously you can see that the pyruvate nitrite sample has now turned to a bright orange color. It looks a lot like a ferric oxyhydroxide. And then if we take those dried minerals, dissolve an acid, and then we do a colorimetry treatment that basically measures the amount of Fe2 to Fe3 in that, in that solution, which then you can backtrack and say that's how much is in the mineral. So we can track oxidation state as a function of time. And so this graph shows the percent Fe2 measured after the experiment. In this case, it's about 30 minutes after, so it's not even the whole four days. The shaded part shows how much Fe2 we initially put in, and then the solid part shows how much was detected after addition of the nitrate or nitrite. So we observe that nitrite-containing experiments, they exhibit a very high degree of iron oxidation, up to about, it's like 90, 95% of the iron is now oxidized regardless of whether it is starting out at 100% Fe2 or 50% Fe2. We also observe that nitrate experiments do exhibit some iron oxidation. It's not nearly as much, but it's about, say, 10 to 15%. And then we analyze the nitrite sample. So this one here, we analyze this with XRD. And we did this also from the 100% and the 50% Fe2 starting experiment. So it's both of these red boxes here. And so the XRD data shows that the samples match very well to hematite, which is a ferric mineral. So it seems that the presence of nitrite in these experiments is causing the formation of pretty much completely oxidized iron minerals. And the presence of nitrate is causing intermediately oxidized iron minerals to form. And then as for the organic reactions, <clears throat> here are the results of these NMR uh, samples. And basically what you're looking for is the presence of the peaks that indicate the amino acid. So C and F in both of these are the controls. So these are where the ammonia is added and nothing else, nothing, nothing, no other nitrogen species are added. And so you see these arrows, those show the amino acids that you expect to form. And so you can see the absence of these peaks in all the other spectra. So basically the conclusion of the organic experiments here were that we did not see any amino acids forming in experiments with only nitrate or nitrite, despite all this evidence that I just showed that nitrate or nitrite reduction was occurring because the iron is getting oxidized. So since we know that the iron is getting oxidized, presumably the nitrate that's doing that is getting reduced. And so we ask, is there actually ammonia present in this system? Because that, that would be the prediction if we were gonna make an amino acid. And we did colorimetry analysis. You could do this for ammonia as well and for nitrate and nitrite on the same liquid samples. And we did detect the nitrate nitrate that we put there, but we did not see any ammonia. So we know that nitrate or nitrite can reduce to other things besides ammonia, for example, N2O. So maybe a different product is being formed. Or is it possible that the ammonia gets formed and then it's somehow consumed by a different process? Because as I showed in the previous slide, ammonia can also react with other nitrogen species. So is it getting consumed? So we wanted to do a test of this and see if we took the nitrate, ex the nitrite experiment and we add more ammonia to it after the iron is oxidized, then will amino acids form? And if so, that would make sense. And if not, then maybe that, that ammonia is also getting consumed. And so we did an experiment where we added progressively increasing amounts of ammonia from 5, 10, 25, and 50 millimolar. So going really quite high. 
And we did not observe any glycine formation from glyoxalate until we got to 50 millimolar ammonia. And so that's strange because as I showed previously, even at low ammonia concentrations like five millimolar, we did see glycine formation from this precursor. So we do also see that the ammonia we added is still there. So there it is, we detected it after one week. So it's not being otherwise consumed. It's not escaping from the system somehow. So this is interesting because why is this happening and what is really the effect of the nitrate and the nitrite on this reaction? So looking back at this chart, uh, basically we can see that you don't really form very many amino acids in very oxidized iron mineral systems with the exception of some glycine, but only at pH 10. And for alanine, it never formed at when the iron mineral was completely oxidized. And so we, we know that we also did observe that the pyruvate and glyoxalate reacted with the iron mineral to make their reduced products sometimes, but they never made the amino acid. So we think what's happening is that the nitrate or nitrite is driving iron oxidation. And then when the iron mineral gets too oxidized, like in this case of nitrite, this prevents amino acid formation, even if you have ammonia present. So this means that if you have a nitrate or nitrite containing system and iron minerals, perhaps the formation of these amino acids needs to occur at a different iron redox state. So in a, in a gradient system like a vent, maybe you have the formation of ammonia reaction is happening in one spot and the actual reaction to make that organic compound is happening at a different spot. So that's some of the future work that we're looking into. And then I'll move into our next section, but before I go on, does anyone have any questions? I actually have one if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so this is a really, to me, this is a really cool insight, which is that despite the fact the overall redox state of the system didn't change, the individual speciation of whether the reducing power is partitioned into the iron or into the, uh, or, or into the nitrogen phase seemed to matter. So I think this, to me, this seems important because it uh, makes us step back a little bit from a thermochemical approach and start to think about the kinetics. Uh, has this guided any of the, uh, any of kind of your approach to this problem? Well, we, we haven't done any modeling on this, but I think that it would be a good idea. So things like what are the kinetics of the nitrite reacting with iron versus the kinetics of iron reducing the organics? Because also in the in the previous set of experiments with only ammonia, we do see that it seems to take a little longer for the amino acid to form than it does for the reduced product to form. So looking at these kinetics and how that might vary as a function of conditions, especially like temperature, I think would be very interesting. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So basically all this, this work is abiotic organic chemistry, but it's prebiotic because these are reactants and products that are very interesting for the origin of life. And how does this type of work really feed into looking for life on other planets? So in a general sense, we want to think about what is the difference between life and non-life? And this is a recent study that we published in Astrobiology, and this figure shows kind of ever escalating complexity or function of different organic things. And going from A, which is prebiotic milieu, these are just simple things like a nucleotide or an amino acid. B is more biologically relevant molecules like say ATP or a lipid. C could be organic polymers like a peptide maybe. D could be a functional polymer like a longer peptide or a pre-RNA. E it could be protocells, organic membranes that do or do not contain other organics. And then F is actual life, like a cell. And so we chose all of the things in this figure to represent things that are in the literature for the origin of life that people have made in the lab. So there are things that we know for sure can be made abiotically because it has been done. And so if you were to set a boundary on this, on this chart between such that if you found something more complex than this, then you could say it's from life versus if it's less complex than this, then you need to say it's not life. Where would you place that boundary? And so what we argue is that if you start off with a prebiotic world, for example, the early earth, or maybe somewhere like Enceladus today where organics are being produced, if you had a world with minimal biology and with prebiotic chemistry occurring, the signature at which you would, you would need to find to say that there's life present would be actually a quite a high bar because all of these things are prebiotic and they've all been produced abiotically. And so if they're, if they're being produced on this planet, then you can't just detect, say, a proto-enzyme and say, I have found life, because that may have been made prebiotically. So when you don't know for sure that there's life on the planet, and prebiotic chemistry is a possibility, the bar for what we have to detect to say there's life gets, re it gets really high. Whereas if you have a biotic world, 
like the earth today, for example, if you find any of these things like peptides, you know, nucleotide polymers, vesicles, things like that, most likely it has to do with life because life has spread and dominated on this planet. And so the, the bar for where abiotic chemistry ends is pretty, is much smaller. It's not saying that there's no abiotic chemistry on earth, <clears throat> but that it's not going to reach these, these high complexities that you might get in a prebiotic world. So basically what we're saying is that when you go to other places, we need to think about where, not just is this thing a biosignature, but where is the biosignature threshold? So where do you place that boundary between life and non-life? And how does that relate to the geochemical history of the planet in question? And a lot of that will have to do with the geochemical history, the amount of organic chemistry that's possible today and in the past, and then what we know about the history of organics and or life on that world. So that is all I have, and I'm happy to take any further questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions either online or in the room? I'd like to ask one then. Um, could you talk a little bit about ionic strength effects here? For example, I know that if you have, if you crank up, uh, if you're undergoing wet dry cycles or you're in a particularly salty ocean, uh, perhaps you'll have ionic screening effects that'll somewhat inhibit some of these reactions, or maybe they'll alter the balance of their different reaction chains. Have you been able to decompose those yeah. effects? So that is that is likely to be a thing, but we have not actually tested it yet because we we chose to vary just these conditions so far. The, the experiments I showed have a pretty high ionic strength because we have high molarities of the iron. So there's gonna be a lot of sodium chloride in there. And in the cases where there's hundreds of millimolar ammonia, there would be a lot of chloride as well. And so I do think that's gonna be an effect. And the, as you say, the salts will interact with the mineral surfaces and differently at different pHs. And some of them will react differently with organics than others, if at all. And so I think that is a permutation that would be an interesting one to study. We just haven't really had the bandwidth to do that. Do you have a question? No. Stepping back a little and looking at the implications for some of this last set of work you presented for the search for life of, for example, Enceladus or Europa, um, I was a little bit surprised to hear you say that um, it's readily, it's easy to make protocells or functional polymers abiotically. To me, if I, if someone found those in Europa's uh, in, in a plume or something, I'd, I'd start getting a little excited. Could you comment a little bit more on the syntheses that lead to some of these um, uh, uh, systems? So that would be, I can send you papers. These are other things in the, in the literature. It's not to say that certain things are easy or not, but after all, origin of life is also not easy. And so to, to you know, posit that an organic is because of life is actually a more challenging bar than saying it's from an even a challenging prebiotic reaction. And so I think that it's just important to remember that if there is an abiotic possibility, then life is, I mean, life has to be the hypothesis of last resort. And so we have to understand very well what all the abiotic possibilities are and prebiotic chemistry counts as abiotic. And so we have to look in that literature and then do experiments under different planetary conditions to understand where that boundary might lie. All right. If there's no other questions, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much.